You're listening to LeaderCast, episode 157. Welcome to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. Today we're having a conversation with Chris Thompson. Chris is the pastor of Selmer First United Methodist Church in Selmer, Tennessee. We talk about his belief talent and how that talent shapes his leadership by focusing on his core values, helping people to unite around a common vision, even when it's hard, and not giving up. We cover a lot of ground on this podcast. I look forward to you listening to our conversation with Chris Thompson. As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode along with Chris's top five strengths and any of the resources that we mention in the podcast on the show notes page at transformingmission.org forward slash podcast. Follow the link to episode 157. Chris, welcome to, to LeaderCast. It's great to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Would you tell us who you are and what you get paid to do? I'm Chris Thompson, and I'm the pastor at Summer First United Methodist Church in Summer, Tennessee. And that's what I get paid to do. I get paid to uh, pastor churches. So, Chris, one of the questions that we ask all of our guests to get us started, what does being a disciple of Jesus mean to you? Uh, it's a really interesting question. We have, we're, I'm in a cohort right now. We're talking about innovation in, in missions right now. And we're talking about defining discipleship. And I pulled a little bit from Lynn Sweet. It's about revealing the Christ that is already there and present. And then I, I kind of make it twofold. It is also taking on, learning to take on the full nature of Christ, of allowing less less of me and more of Christ uh, to reign in my life and guide and direct me that I would live perfectly into the Imago Dei. Uh, thank you for that. As we as we do our work, you know that we talk about Clifton strengths, and so all of us are uniquely created, made by God, and we all have different ways in which we respond and lead in the world. So we know that that you've been a part of understanding your strengths. What are your top five? Yeah, my, my top five is connectedness, belief, input, maximizer, and strategic. Chris, you know this well, and you've already said this before we hit the record button, that you know, isolating out your top five, you can't do it. They're all a part of who God has created you to be. But for the sake of our conversation today, we wanted to focus in on your belief talent theme. And so for our listeners who may not be familiar with that theme, let me just share with you what Gallup says that theme is all about. They say that people exceptionally talented in the belief theme have certain core values that are unchanging. It's out of these values that emerge a defined purpose for their lives. So my question for you in that is, what values do you care most about in life? I guess what I would want to say, even to some people, as I started, is that most people would just would assume that belief itself, you know, as as someone who is uh, a follower of Christ or Christian, however you want to define that, is that belief would just be on the top top five of, of most people. But uh, belief, like what you said, it being that common core. Uh, value that drives you and there's a lot that probably I guess drives me that I don't realize is driving me that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about I just do it and I guess that's probably because of some of my other sh uh, strengths that I, I rely on is that I've got I've got it there and I just I just do it but they're all like all of our strengths are they're intertwined but for me one of the core values that I know that I live into and try to live into as a pastor is unity I do think uh, uh, Christ is is the one that, that unifies us all. We we definitely see that at the 
table of thanksgiving where we were all made equal they were all seen as equal uh, in, in god's eyes you know, even for me i feel that my job and responsibility as a pastor is to pull differing sides uh, together and show how that we can work together. One thing that I did mention a few Sundays ago as we we're going through a sermon series, uh, Life Together in Christ, and specifically in the book of Ephesians, uh, but we're looking at this understanding how you can take two good opinions and make one really, really good way of doing things. And so I think that's where listening takes which i'm not always a great listener i can i can vouch for that but but i try to listen as as much as as i can to individuals other things that drive me it's kind of hard to say you know i don't I, you know i i value and this is kind of i guess this is kind of a churchy thing but i i just don't do well with people who don't tell the truth and so Truth telling is is a big thing for me. So my biggest fear, like even on Sundays, is while I'm preaching, or if I'm doing counseling, or if I'm just talking with somebody, is that I would commit heresy, and that that's that's a big fear for me. And, I, and as I say, fear, but it's also a value is the fact that I teach my kids and tell my kids that I would rather them just tell me the truth than them lie to me. It is better that I hear the truth than a lie, and we can I can deal with whatever mistake that they made a lot better than if they lied to me. I don't I don't personally like being lied to. Just tell me the truth. I can deal with the truth better than I can deal with you if you lied to me, and then I find out the truth later. I think a lot of us are probably wired that way too. I'm, I'm trying to think of it, these other things that actually drive me. I think my belief is influenced by listening a lot. So I, I guess that would be a core value is is listening. That's especially with with our current race issues. Talking with our African American pastors here in town, we've been doing a, a big thing on unity in that in that retrospect. And one of the first things I said is how can I listen to you better? Like what are the things that I'm missing when you're talking to me? And you know, of course, that goes with empathy, but it's really understanding the position uh, that they're in. And that has helped help me shape me. And, and I've grown a lot over the last few months in in understanding what those who are persecuted through racism are dealing with. I, I'm sure there's much more that drives me, but I can't list any off the top of my head anymore. <laughs> Chris, we know that in some research that Gallup has done that there are four needs of followers. This, this is what every follower needs from a leader, to build trust, to show compassion, provide stability, and offer hope. And what we've learned and, and really enjoy is that every leader is put together in a unique way. So, so all of those things come about in, in different ways. The definition that we use for leader comes from Brene Brown, anyone who takes responsibility for recognizing the potential in people and or processes and has the courage to develop that potential. So being a leader and looking at the needs of followers, I want you to, as you as you've been doing, think about that belief talent theme and and the leadership in this season of life and service. We want to ask you some questions now in regard to those needs of followers based upon our definition of, of leadership or being a leader. That first one, building trust, how or when have you shown others what it means to be a servant leader? I, I guess biggest example is showing my vulnerability of the the willingness to clean the, the, the church floors, but also at the same time that I get get down and dirty w with people who are in need and help them fix their house where they just need help, physical help, and not just money thrown at them. But at the same time is, you know, and it goes to the next question. I know it's there, but it, it, I think this being a servant leader shows uh, the compassion that we have for others. And this is, I guess it's kind of working out of my connected strength, but it, 
I guess, outflows from, from belief is that my belief is that, you know, somehow we're all connected or I can be connected with everybody on some level. And I think for, for me, is I realize that Christ, whether he did this intentionally or not, but as I read the stories of how he interacted with individuals, is that he met them where they were at, but that's, this is, that's also how he connected with them. He never stood above them. He was right there with them. And I, I guess that's where I'm at as modeling being a servant leader is trying my best to model what Christ uh, did in the Gospels and what I feel that Christ is still doing for me today. As we think about the the second thing that followers need, Chris, in terms of showing compassion, you've you've spoken already about being a good listener. So I'm wondering if you can share, when have you been a sounding board for others about what's meaningful in their lives? With a lot of pastor friends through this this past year is being able to let them rant freely without the fear that they're that I'm going to go uh, tell a district superintendent or you know you know anything that would hurt them or say anything publicly that would hurt them. And you know my friends have done that well for me too. But you know I got I got a late message the other night of. Uh, one of my pastor friends and you know we're we were talking about how people are going to be very upset at, at his his church that he's serving that things are going to look a lot different this advent and, and christmas and you know just those things that we constantly are facing i i'm pretty vocal with with my church community and i've already just said it because it felt like it was the only way that i could help the church understand that these decisions that I'm making isn't to make myself happy because some of the decisions that have been made are probably not the decisions I would just personally make, but I'm trying to do it as well as I can for, for the good of the, the whole. A lot of things is being able to talk about our problems, hear it come out of our mouth and hear the reaction of another individual and let them know that they're not crazy. Yeah. Part of what, part of what I'm hearing as you share the examples, Chris, is how your belief talent and and your other ones, but I'm listening for your belief talent, how your belief talent, because of your core values, you simply show up and are present to people. And you create that space for them to be able to say whatever they need to say as I've listened to you, and you've done it in several different ways now, talk about the core value that you have of unity. So taking that value and keeping it in mind, how do you help people know that you as a leader, that you are somebody who's for something and not actually against something? As a, as a leader corporately from, from the pulpit, a lot of the messages this year have been shaped around the idea of how we can work together and what that looks like and how, especially in a divisive uh, political climate, how we can come together. You know, the, I can't remember who said this uh, a while back, uh, a few years ago, it was talking about how, you know, we are all on the same team as, as Americans and we can't fight against each other if we're on the same team. And I try to just open up people's eyes of how, you know, the relationships that I have or, or I have friends that have uh, differing opinions of mine. I still desire to be their friend and, and know them and get to know them. I think we do better when we, we can go back to listening to each other. Because there's, there's things that I haven't thought about that other people have thought about. And then I have, of course, this I've never been great at sending out uh, newsletters to the church. But COVID got me to where I was, I've been doing that weekly. And that has allowed me to shape this mindset and understanding of, okay, here's, here's the foundation we're building off of. And I've talked about uh, church history. I've talked about where we're going to kind of move to and how, how we're adapting. And even when you get into, get into that is when you try to shape the culture, what I've 
learned is it's not that people don't want to change. What they fear the most is what they're going to lose. And so I'm trying to be more mindful of uh, to say, okay, this is how things will be better, if you want to say it in that terms. And, you know, it seems like we're losing this, but this is actually going to take us into the next step. Even though like with class meetings is one of the things I've been talking about is it's it's the the new old and you know people you've probably heard this a lot where people are just they'll they'll say, well, I wish we could get back to those days and for me i'm I want to get back to those days of good class meetings because this is where the church was it's at its re- real strong spiritual formation and discipleship. And so for me, building this value system of stability in in the middle of uh, COVID and trying to reshape our own thinking of what it's going to look like when we really kind of come out of this post-COVID worship, what it's going to look like. And I guess the, the biggest foundation, the, it's, it's sometimes it does sound like I'm fighting against every core value that the church has but i try i try my best to say these are good things but it has taken taken us away from what's actually important that we don't serve ourselves but we serve others what i said was you were standing in the middle and trying to bring them together there are probably people on either side that would say you need to be with us if you're really if you're really a Christian, if you're really a Methodist, if you're really this, you're going to say this. And what you've been doing is standing in the middle, trying to bring the two extremes together. Yeah, yeah. I, I like what you said at the beginning. Of I started with belief, and then I met them. I've met them where they're at. I've have been at another church. I've I, I had a church leader come to me and she said, thank you uh, for meeting us where we're at and not just trying to tell us where we've got to be. And I, I guess, I guess from all the church, church leaders that I, I look up to, that's a consistent theme that I see in them. I mean, that they are always meeting the people where they're at and saying, okay, I'm going to work with you. And then you know, we know internally where they need to go, but we just keep we keep uh, nudging them towards uh, that direction, and then and standing in the gap and pulling the two sides together, which I think is I think it's a model that that Jesus models well for us is is standing in the, in the gap and pulling us together to to show us how how we are one in Christ. So another value that you've used then to provide stability is listening. So mm-hmm. you're you're listening to the people and and then helping them take steps in the direction they need to go because you've listened to them you've you've made them feel valuable mm-hmm. worthy uh, have some worth so that you are developing the kind of relationship you need to have to provide that stability that's what it sounds like to me yeah and i guess and then playing off of the connectedness part i'm going to find out where where we're so you so alike and highlight those features or uniqueness about our relationship. You know, I shocked a, I shocked a church at once, you know, that my first appointment that I pulled out my Carhartt jacket and they thought I was just a city boy in their terms. And I thought that was funny, but that, that was a, that was a big thing for them that they saw their pastor even wearing clothes that are like theirs. So yeah, meeting the people uh, where they're at is vitally important as a pastor. We can't we can't be above them. I don't think Christ was while well, Christ was above us uh, and is above us. I think he you know he models it well for us of saying, look, this is this is what it really means. It, it is to I'm going to stretch this passage of scripture, scripture, but to take off our cloaks uh, of our our suits and and that and and put on a pair of shorts. And sandals and, and just really be with the people. Yeah, you're talking about being incarnational. Yeah. 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 Sarah, did you have another question? Yeah, and it really focuses in on this last aspect of the needs of followers around offering hope. And as I'm listening to you talk about leading your congregation, Chris, I'm wondering 
Where does your focus on unity offer hope to others? Where are you seeing that? The, the biggest the biggest thing that I think it offers is that we are the church, that we have fully embodied what Christ has called us to. And I think when we step into that, we, we talk about oftentimes, I, I think for, for, for a lot of people that they've heard too many messages about heaven and hell and not on what it really means to be the body of Christ. And I think I think that's why even some of my messages for my local context, it can be a little hard for them to wrap their minds around because it sounds like this young pastor with these new ideas ha- has come in and these are things that they haven't heard before. But the, the way in which I guess I offer hope the most is that it goes it goes back to the lord's prayer you know on, on earth as it is in heaven and when we are united uh, we have brought heaven or continuing heaven here on earth in a, in a way that i think we're called called to and of course the the hope for a lot of church people is that the bills can be paid and that you know we have more members and those type of things but the the hope is is those who are hurting, you know, the mothers that have to work three or four jobs, how can the church unite around that mother and allow her to have us have a Sabbath and where we are, we dwell with each other daily and we hear the, the needs of each other and we, we, we take care of each other. And I know, I know that sounds like a, a utopian uh, mindset and it kind of is, but at the same time, I do believe that the that what we're called to is when we make those decisions to really work with each other, that we can experience that new heaven and new earth that has been been begun in us. For me, that that I guess that's the hermeneutic that I'm working from is that when we work together, we've walked fully into uh, the kingdom uh, of God, God's economy. So Chris, what do you celebrate God doing in your life and, and or your leadership in the past three, five, six, seven months? The, the biggest thing that I celebrate, and I do write this down on my yearly report to that the district superintendents look at of when we do our evaluations. I always put, and sometimes I do it just to see the reaction of the district superintendent. But I, and I'm, I'm serious about it though. Is I haven't quit. There have been a lot of moments that I just wanted to quit. That the tension has been so great that I, I didn't see my family that much in the first uh, two months of COVID because of the massive shift that we made and how long it was taking to just deal with things, to, to try to answer questions in a completely unknown world. But I do, I do give thanks to, to God that I haven't quit. I, I you know, I, I look at it in the same terms of, of Jesus in the garden. My humanity is, yeah, I want to quit. And Jesus Jesus didn't physically want to die on the cross, but he says, not my will, but your will be done. And it's, it's the same thing. You know, God and I have a lot of conversations, and at the end of it, it is, and it's not my will, but your will be done. And, and, and so even leading, leading off of that with the other question is, it is with God not allowing me to quit, I've done courageous things through all of this of saying uh, saying things that uh, needed to be said for a long time and you know we can with a lot of grace you know that it goes back to that hope there is hope in all of this that i do place my my hope and trust in god and that christ is lord through all of this my son the other day asked me he said so dad how come how come every time we go to churches you're the pastor at them and I kind of laughed and, <laughs> and and explained explained him kind of the background and I said you know he said well why don't you do anything he, the one of the follow-up questions was well why don't you just do something else you know why haven't you done something else and I said you know we talked I talked about my calling but I remember the call that I w- had when I was five years old but didn't come into it until my senior year of high school. 
but I remember, I remember God calling me to, to lead his people and, you know, being a pastor's kid, I saw the ins and outs. I saw the dark side of ministry and I didn't want it. I didn't want it for my family. I couldn't let go. And God kept pulling and echoing the call to me. And every time I know that I say yes, and I step up into the pulpit and I'm saying yes to what God is asking me to say, there is peace. Even though I'm stressed out like crazy from what I know what I'm going to say and what the ramifications might be from what I say, there's still peace at the end of it that I've honored God uh, in the middle of it. So even and so, my word of encouragement to those is don't give up, uh, don't give hope, don't lose sight uh, of the direction that God is leading you. And the call is great, and it comes with a, a very, very heavy burden on us that are pastors. And thank you for not giving up. <laughs> Because you you are a gift. You are a gift to the church that you lead. You are a gift to the family, and you are a gift to your community. But most importantly, you are a gift to the kingdom of God. And so, thanks for, for not giving up. So, are you ready for our rapid-fire questions? These are yeah. 10 questions that are quick, fun questions, really intended for our listeners to get to know you a little bit. And so, yeah, Tim's going to get us started. Chris, when you get started in the morning, what's your beverage of choice? No, it's always coffee. (laughs) What is your favorite or go-to Bible verse? The Shema. You are Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord is God. And that we worship him only, coupled with Jesus's addition to it, that we love ourselves and love our neighbors. Psalm 13 is my favorite psalm. You know, even in the midst of lament and this great strife that God, I can still praise God in, in the midst of it. And David uh, did well to show me through that psalm how even in the darkest of valleys that we can worship God. What's your favorite season and why? Favorite season? I used to say Thanksgiving, but it is Christmas. I love Christmas time. But Advent is a, a great time of the year of preparation. But I love love winter. I love snow. I don't. When I think of vacation, I think of going to Alaska and sitting on a, a cabin in Alaska and watching moose go by. When did you receive your first Bible? I think, I think it was, so I, I was dedicated in the Free Methodist Church, and I think I think I was given a Bible then, and I know shortly after that, I, you know, I've received numerous of, of gifts of Bibles throughout, you know, church education and, and things like that. What do people misunderstand about you? My heavy brow. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think I'm 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 not happy a lot of the times, but I, I am. I think I come off very very serious, and I am. But I do like to have a good good laugh. What is the last thing that you read <laughs> today, or in a book? Uh, in a book, you you name it. I, I, uh, there's a book uh, that just came out. It's called Honest Advent, and it's by Scott Erickson. And uh, a couple of things that he he says in there, but I'll just kind of uh, give you a brief a brief thing that he said in it. it. You know, is 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 the Christmas story just something that happened a long time ago, or is it a story that is still uh, happening today? And then, of course, he's got a lot of great illustrations in that book. But I definitely recommend it. What's a favorite vacation spot or place to relax? Our vacation generally is because my wife's family is in Oklahoma. We live in Tennessee. My my dad has retired here in West Tennessee. Is we uh, generally go to Oklahoma, and while my father in law always thanks me for bringing the family there, he doesn't realize that it is a place that I can fully be myself with all my scars and all my hangups on life. And I'm fully accepted of who I am as an individual, but it is also a place that I can feel 
completely at, at peace when I get to just sit down in the recliner in their house. What's bringing you joy right now? That's a hard question to ask, <laughs> ask with with uh, coming off a very hard weekend as well. My gr- my greatest joy is just the the conversations I've had with my boys and my wife uh, here recently. I've I've had my boys help me with video announcements and we have shared an amazing amount of laughs like we were we are all we are on the floor laughing <laughs> this last time, and uh, they used to they they there's uh, some tense moments where I have them do it over again and they get upset and and then they don't feel like they can do it and then they you know, we've had a moment where both I've had two of them cry on me and <laughs> I'm not yelling at them they just they just I guess it's fear or, or insecurity but I. You know, it's it's a great moment where I can instill encouragement into them that they can do it. And they're doing it with me just saying, okay, say this. And they have got no script in front of them. And they're just saying it verbatim. And they do a great job. And the people in the church love it as well. It's way better than me doing it. I mean, people have liked that, but it is way more entertaining to see my, my kids do it. What music brings you meaning or brings you peace? There is an album. It's by Greg LaFollette, and it's, it is based on the Book of Common Prayer. And he has redone, not redone, but he has given great melodies and space to just be able to, you know, sing, sing holy, holy in, in, in such a way that we don't, you know, you don't get in just reciting part of our liturgy, the singing, the confession, the most merciful God. That's probably one of my favorites of his. But yeah, uh, when I am needing to recenter myself, I put put that that album on by Greg Lafollette. He is he's a musician uh, in Nashville and a, and a worship leader in Nashville and a, at a New Start Church. And it was really interesting how I even came across across that album. So. This is the last question. What is your favorite part of Christmas or Advent? Well, if if I'm in the right place, it would be snow. But (laughs) Christmas Eve is probably my favorite. I remember after a Christmas Eve service that we had done a few years ago, I stepped outside of the sanctuary door to go into the house, had finished everything, and I looked up at the sky, and I had just talked about light. And looked up at the sky, and I believe it was the moon was just so bright that night. And there's so much peace in it for me, and peace and comfort. And, and in a lot of ways, it's it's just that is that creation is uh, always you know what uh, Saint Francis of Assisi said. There's, there's two Bibles: we have creation, and we have the written word. And God is always revealing Himself, God to me through all of creation. And, and that's that's probably the moment that I like the most is where I get to pause in the midst of all this craziness that we've created. Pause, and then God speaks. And that hope of anticipation gets to I get to really celebrate that with my 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 family, not just myself, but my family. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. Thank you for sharing a part of your heart and your soul and the way that God has gifted you with us and with the people who will listen to this podcast. I am grateful for you. Is there any last minute word of wisdom that you would like to share with our listeners? In the midst of all of this, don't give up. We do we do have a, a God who is pouring his love on us. I say it to my friend all the time that wants to give up too on occasions that while he feels defeated that you know God is God is carrying us along uh, through all of this uh, whether we realize it or not and and to continue to do the best that you can live into the strengths that you have don't try to live in the strengths that you don't have you'll just feel defeated all the time but work on the strengths that you have, live into them, and know that as we have all been given these different gifts, that what Paul tells us, that it all, in the end, accomplishes the same goal. 
and for me, I take such great comfort in that. It has helped me through that whole process of, I, I so desire some, some other people's gifts, but I have realized that God has given me these unique gifts to proclaim uh, the good news in in a way that might not be completely kosher for some people, but with all grace and love. So continue to continue to be you. And when you feel defeated, there are those of us that are praying for you and fighting for you. Chris, today we're glad that you joined us. And I am especially grateful that you have allowed yourself to uh, be open to God, to let God kind of reach out and touch us today through your those core values that you have and how you use those to bring about the unity that you talk about and to, and to bring people into the presence of God. You've done that well, and I appreciate it today. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate you and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Tim and Sarah, for your leadership that you provide in doing the podcast itself, too. I told you we'd cover a lot of ground. So here are my two questions for you today from this conversation with Chris. We're at the end of the year. We're getting close to Christmas. Soon the calendar will turn to 2021. I always find this is a good time of year to stop and reflect on what is good and right and beautiful, even when things are are crazy and different. So think about the last week, maybe 10 days. What are three ways that you have used your strengths? Now, please hear me. You might not have the Clifton Strengths language, and that's okay. Think about the things that you are good at or the places that you find yourself losing track of time and you do naturally. Think about the things that come easy to you. What are three ways in the past week that you have used your strengths? The second question is around your core values. As you think about 2020, what core value do you celebrate for being a guiding light this past year? And if you find yourself saying, oh gosh, I don't know that it was, think about what's coming up. What core value will you focus on being a guiding light in 2021? There are your two questions for this episode. Next week, Tim and I will have a episode where we wrap up the year and hopefully set the stage for 2021 and what is coming on the podcast then. Until then, have a very Merry Christmas. Enjoy time with the family that you are able to connect with. And I pray that you experience moments of peace and hope and love this Christmas season. Merry Christmas. Now go lead a movement of Jesus followers. Bye for now.